Hi everyone, this video is part two in the 2B series on memory from the Unit 2 content for AP Psychology students. This particular video focuses on memory and coding. As you can see here on the unit outline, this video is the second in the series for memory in a set of five videos. In this particular lesson, we're going to focus on information getting into the mind. Throughout the video, I will cover a few major themes, and by the end, you should be able to answer these three key focus questions. These are the vocabulary words you should take note of while you're watching the video. By the end, you should be able to define and describe them. So as you learned in the first video about memory, cognitive psychologists use memory models to try to explain how memory works. They're like frameworks to help us conceptualize our memory. And one of the most common ways psychologists conceptualize memory is through a computer-like model that they call the information processing model. Now, it's really important that you know our memory is not like a computer. They use this model just to help us better understand memory, but computers can can save information exactly how it was put in and then pick it up exactly how it was left. And our memory is not like that. Our memory can be influenced and distorted by all kinds of factors, but the information processing model just helps us better understand those steps of memory going in, memory staying, and then memory being taken out. And so in today's video, I will focus on that first step that's called encoding. So let me break down each one of these steps so you have a better understanding of where we're going. So according to this framework, the information goes in first, and that is called encoding. Information must first go into our minds before it can be processed and retained. And encoding is that first step. And the way that information is encoding can also influence um, how it is kept or how easily it can be pulled out. Now, the next step is called storage. So after the information goes in, it will either be let go or retained and stored. And this particular storage method might have, um, depending on where it goes, a different capacity or duration of how long it can be held. Now, the last step in the information processing model is called retrieval. And retrieval refers to the accessing of information from storage or taking information out of the mind. So according to the information processing model, the memory that we have is comprised in stages or processes from encoding, storing, and retrieving. And today's lesson is specifically going to focus on encoding. So automatic processing is when memories are going into your mind without your active and conscious purposeful, intentional awareness of it. So this would be like remembering the route you take to school or remembering a familiar noise, um, sound, smell. Those are all things you probably aren't intentionally trying to remember, but that just seeps into our memory without intentional processing. Um, when that information is going in, it's almost incidental. We're not intentionally taking that information in. You might also think of a time where a smell reminded you of a loved one or a smell triggered a memory. Likely you didn't intentionally encode that memory. It just went in without you processing it. And so these are examples of automatic processing. Whereas effortful processing is when you are purposefully attempting to get the information in. And an example of this might be if you're studying for a test. This would be a situation where you are consciously and purposefully and intentionally trying to actively take in that information, hoping that you will remember it later. That's effortful processing. When you are purposely trying to create a memory for information, you are effortfully processing it, and you can do this in a number of different ways. We're going to start by discussing how you can process information shallowly or shallow processing or deeply. If you are shallowly processing information, you are less likely to retain that information and retrieve it, whereas if you use a deep processing method, you are more likely to retain and keep that information. So suppose you're studying for an exam on the functions of different brain parts. 
you will be effortfully trying to get that information in in a way that you are going to retain it and keep it. Now, if you are studying that information with flashcards and suppose you notice that the definition for the word thalamus is about four lines long and you think to yourself, okay, that's how I'm going to remember this. The definition, it's really long. And every time you review that flashcard for the word thalamus, you recognize the shape and the length of the definition. The problem with this is that you really don't know the meaning of the thalamus and you're just focused on the structure of the words and phrases. And this particular strategy is a shallow processing strategy because you're not really encoding based on the meaning, but rather what the words look like. And so you're really unlikely to remember what the thalamus does. This is a structural processing method. Now you can do a phonemic processing method when you're trying to purposefully get information in. And if you focus on that word phonemic, you'll see the prefix is phone and that prefix means sound. So what this word means is that you are processing information based on what it sounds like. So if you are studying the word thalamus, you might think to yourself, thalamus. Oh man, that sounds like alumnus or anonymous, or you might even think, oh, that sounds like hypothalamus. But if you are just remembering a word based on what it sounds like and you're not making any meaningful connection to it, um, you're really not going to make a long-term connection to it either. So phonemic processing is another more shallow method. The deepest method of effortful processing is called semantic processing. And this is when you process information based on its meaning. And so if you're focusing on the meaning of the word thalamus, you would likely start by reading the definition and then making sure you really understand what it means. You might look up anything you don't understand, and then you might try to connect that meaning to things that you already know, um, trying to build some connections. And this is your attempt to make sense or meaning out of that information, not just trying to to, uh, remember it based on what it sounds like or looks like. So the thalamus is the part of the brain where sensory information is taken to, and then the thalamus directs it towards the part of the brain that processes that information. So if you know that, then you might try to connect it to other things that you know that are similar. So maybe you might think of the thalamus like a front desk worker at a company who directs people where they need to go. And so then maybe you pair that with the word thalamus and you think about how the desk worker might say, welcome, thou must go this way. Welcome, thou must go that way, sending them on their way where they need to be processed. That would be taking the meaning of the information and trying to connect it to things you already know to build meaningful connections. So an, an important takeaway here is that you can intentionally and effortfully try to take in information, but you want to make sure that you're doing it semantically because this is the best way to ensure that the information you're taking in will stay long term rather than just trying to remember things based on the way that they look or the way that they sound. So let's talk about different tools for effortful processing. First, there are so many things that you need to remember, whether it's your schoolwork or addresses or to-do lists, passwords, shopping lists. There's so many things, and we often use intentional tools to help us remember when we have a big batch of information, we can draw on that tool to help remind us of the information we need. Um, you've probably used a tool called a mnemonic device in your lifetime to help you remember a batch of information. Maybe you've been taught one by your teacher. I'll give you some examples. If you've ever heard, never eat soggy waffles, that phrase will likely remind you of the order of the directions on a compass. Never eat soggy waffles is north, east, south, west. Now, if I said the phrase, please excuse my dear Aunt Sally or Pim Das, you might remember the order of operations for solving a math equation. Or if you heard a phrase like face on space, or every good boy does fine. If you read music, that might help you remember the locations of the notes on the music staff. Now, it doesn't have to necessarily be words. Mnemonic devices or these memory tools can be other things. They can be related to images. They can be related to rhymes. You might be somebody who remembers the day or the months that have 31 days by using a memory tool. Some people use their knuckles and they will say the months in order, January, February, March, April. And as you go and touch each knuckle, each knuckle would represent the month that has 31 days. 
Or like me, I remember the rhyme 30 days has September, April, June, and November. All the rest have 31 except February. And that's my rhyme that I say to myself to remember. Now, these are all different types of organizational mnemonic devices, which are just these intentional tools, aids, techniques, or tricks that are meant to help us remember a batch of information. Now, mnemonic devices don't necessarily have to be words. They could be vivid imageries or patterns, but in, in, in simple terms, it's just a tool and it helps us remember a batch of information. One example of, of a mnemonic device is a method of loci. Now, the method of loci involves associating information with different points on a familiar journey. So you're connecting that information with something, like a memory that you already have existing. And so if you walk back through that journey, you can pick up those different pieces of information that you need to remember as you walk in your mind back through that journey. So for example, if you need to remember uh, items on a grocery list, if you wanted to use the method of loci, you could imagine yourself putting each of those items somewhere in your house, or you could imagine those items in different rooms. And as you're going through the grocery store, you can walk back through your house, picking up, okay, the banana, all right, the mango, okay, the honey. As you're intentionally walking yourself back through that story you created um, about different items in a familiar place. So that would be the method of loci. Now, mnemonic devices are, um, are, are tools for effortful processing. So on this slide, I want to start with a demonstration and I'm going to read you a string of numbers and I need you to hold them in your mind as long as you can. Then I will ask you to write them down. So don't write them until I tell you to do so. I just want you to hold them in your mind. All right, here are the numbers. Six, four, five, three, two, six, five, seven, eight, nine. Okay, write down what you can remember. Okay, that probably was challenging unless you use some kind of memory trick. So let's try again and I'm just going to say them in a little bit of a different cadence and let's see if you can remember them better. So either close your eyes or flip your paper over because I don't want you to have those numbers you wrote down in front of you. So let's see if you can remember this string of numbers a little better if I read them to you this way. Ready? Six, four, five. Three, two, six, five, seven, eight, nine. Okay, you can write them down. So this should have been a little bit easier for you by grouping them into more manageable chunks. So chunking leverages our brain's ability to hold information in groups by organizing those individual bits into smaller groups. And chunking is helpful for both short-term working memory, which is really limited. Our short-term working memory can only hold about seven bits of information at a time. So it's really useful to chunk information if we're trying to hold it into our short-term memory, but we also chunk information that's kept into our long-term memory. For example, I'm sure you've utilized chunking to help you remember um, telephone numbers. I, you might even remember your own social security number, possibly your bank card number. Those are all numbers that you probably have stored in your long-term memory and they're chunked down into more meaningful groups to help you better recall them. Another method of meaningful encoding is categorizing. Categorizing is a way to organize information by making meaningful connections to related pieces of information, whether it's through connecting information based on shared characteristics or placing items into similar um, specific topics. These are different ways you could categorize. Now, let me use the example I used previously in the video about studying parts of the brain. If you had flashcards cards with the different parts of the brain on them and you were learning about their functions, after you practice recalling their functions, you could then start to categorize them based on their functions by making connections between the different brain parts. You could sort them into piles that involve survival functions and then piles of flashcards of brain parts that are non-essential functions. Um, you could create piles based on their location. You could put brain parts based on whether if they're located in the 
hindbrain or the mid and inner brain or the um, forebrain, and you could then categorize them based on their location. So when you're grouping information into categories, you're creating meaningful associations between the different items, and that makes it easier to retrieve that information later. So organize information into different groups. That can help you um, create frameworks to organize and then better recall that information. Another method of meaningfully encoding information is through developing hierarchies. Hierarchical organization is when you are arranging that information into a multi-level structure where the concepts are broken down from general categories into more specific subcategories. And this just allows your brain to develop a mental map or an information flow from topic to topic. Hierarchies can be helpful when you are learning complex material and you then create this mental connection between larger concepts and smaller concepts. So in this method, you might start with a few big broad categories and then divide and then subdivide the information into narrower topics or concepts. In 1969, a study by Gordon Bauer and his colleagues found that when they presented a string of concepts to participants, either in a random list or in categories, the participants were two to three times more likely to remember the information when it was presented to them in structural groupings rather than in random lists. So this is helpful for us as students in that if we put information into meaningful groupings, whether we're organizing them in different categories or in hierarchies, we are more likely to recall that information because it was encoded with meaningful connections. Now, distributed practice and massed practice are two different ways to study or effortfully get information in. Distributed practice is also called spaced practice. And this is when you're intentionally encoding information over different sessions or over multiple series of encoding. And so um, distributing that practice is spacing it out. And this is proven to help build stronger, longer lasting memories than mass practice. Mass practice is when you intentionally focus on getting the information in, but you're doing it all in one session. And sometimes students are, refer to this as cramming. So while cramming might seem to work temporarily in the short term, when you distribute your practice over time, it's actually proven to be more effective at retaining information in the long term. And on the diagram on the screen, you can see how this works. Um, this is referred to as the spacing effect, which means that when we space out our study sessions, we are more likely to remember that information better. So you can see at first, when we learn something new, our memory of it is at its strongest. You can see it's at 100% on the chart. But if we don't review it, if you follow that first line, it fades really quickly over time. As you can see by that blue line going down, this is called the forgetting curve. After the first reminder of that information, it fades slower. And then we go to the second reminder, and then it fades a little bit slower. And so every time we go back to review that information, it doesn't fade as quickly. And so with each time we revisit and review, we have made that memory for that information even stronger and even stronger and even stronger. So the spacing effect is suggesting that if we're spacing out our review or when we revisit that information, um, this is allowing us to strengthen that memory better than if we just tried to cram all of that information into one session. So to close out today's video, let's do a, a few short questions for review, I'll read the questions out loud. So make sure that after you hear the question, you pause the video to determine the answer. So the first question is, which of the following is most likely to lead to semantic encoding of a list of words? Question number two says, which of the following is most likely to be encoded automatically? So this concludes today's video on memory encoding. On the left-hand side of the screen are the answers. And then before you finish the video, make sure that you can answer those key focus questions and you can define our essential vocabulary terms.